Welcome to this week's episode of Coffee with the Journalist, brought to you by One Pitch. The guests on our show include some of the most notable journalists from the top U.S.-based publications who cover topics including technology, lifestyle and culture, health, science, consumer products, business news, and beauty and wellness. We discuss their role, the types of stories they cover, what their inbox looks like, and how they connect with sources. Head to onepitch.co and look for the video page to learn more about our new video series. Today on Coffee with the Journalist, we're joined by Elizabeth Buckwald, a personal finance reporter for MarketWatch. Elizabeth started at MarketWatch as a reporting intern in 2018 and previously was a news desk and production intern for CNBC. During the episode, Elizabeth shares specific tips about subject lines, her honest thoughts on exclusives versus embargoes, random places she gets inspiration for her stories, and more. Let's hear from Elizabeth now. Welcome, everyone. This is Coffee with a Journalist, where we chat with a real deal journalist every single time. We've been doing this, I think we're up to like 120-something episodes, maybe more. I'll have to chat with Jared on that. I'm Beth Bamberger. I have an agency called BAM that works with all venture-backed technology companies. And then I also started with Jared One Pitch, which is helping publicists get better pitches to journalists, which is why this show was also created to help us learn what reporters, what journalists really want to hear from publicists and hopefully make the relationships better. So that's why we're here. Today with us is Elizabeth Buckwild. She is the market reporter, actually, excuse me, the personal finance reporter for Market Watch. And we'll start off indeed with what Market Watch is. But first, Elizabeth, thanks for being here live from New York. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. For those who do not know Elizabeth, before we jump into your inbox, what is Market Watch so everyone knows what's up? So a lot of the times when I tell people I work at Market Watch, they're like, oh, got any stock tips? I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, we cover the stock market. Yes. It's a big part of our coverage. We have uh, a lot of good tickers, a lot of you know, trendy topics there, but it is not just the markets and uh -huh. I, it's not actually that much part of my coverage as a personal finance reporter. Yes. But market wall is politics, it's personal finance, it's companies and indeed obviously markets. <laughs> uh -huh. Good. Okay. Now that we got the lay of the land on that, your inbox, what is it looking like these days with pitches? Oh my God. It's all across the board. I'm a zero inboxer. I love being that way, which means I'll delete things as they come in simply based on subject line. And then there's, you know, the emails that I kind of save, I put them in reserve for when I'll leave them on a rainy day or not really rainy day, but you know, when there's mm -hmm. news and you're kind of in a crunch and you're like, okay, who do I reach out to? So, you know, I'll kind of search around oh. in my inbox and just pull up. Okay. So you kind of, you, hearing on vaccine mandate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You kind of have a hybrid approach, which first of all, you are in the extreme of the inbox zero because there's oh, few know, yeah. podcasts <laughs> that, that actually uh, go ascend to that level. So there's that one. But secondly, you also do a filing of some sort. Now, some people have said they've got flags and color coding systems and folders and all this whole thing. Do you do that or is it more just like a running file of stuff and you just use your your search within your inbox as how to find people? Yeah, it's way more of that. I think in my earliest days, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be so organized with folders. And actually, I still have folders from some of my first stories. I thought it would be like cute to do like, oh, the gig economy story that I'm working on. Like, let's put all those emails there. And it just got too cumbersome. So mm, um, it, it all kind of stays in the inbox, which sounds like a bad plan, but it works really well for me because I can search around easily. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do that, to tell you the truth. You just use it as your own personal Google for your sources yeah. and you yeah. put in the keywords, which I think is little told on this show, which is like consider, I mean, I guess you would you would have the right terms in your pitch, but I've even at, I've even thought like, hey, publicists, like, why don't you put a little like keywords, dot dot, economy, COVID implications, or whatever, you know, just so that there's like the it pops up in the search. But anyway, I don't know if anyone's adopted that. There's that. Okay. So 
Elizabeth, you talked on our video part about the importance of the subject line. Would you like to elaborate on how direly important that is for you? I would be glad to. The way I think of a subject line, and this is kind of extreme, but you know, every time I watch the Super Bowl, and I'm not a huge football fan, so I'm watching for commercials yeah. and for the halftime me show. Too. But it me always too. amazes me each year when the stats come out on like, this is how much a 15 second ad costs. So you really got to make the most of that time. That's right. And if you're wasting those 15 seconds with garbage, that's a lot of money out the door. So it's sort mm -hmm. of similar to my inbox, not to that extreme at all. But I think of, and it's probably the case for a lot of journalists, that your subject line is, or the subject line you receive is valuable real estate. You don't want to waste that with words that are taking up space, but aren't helping you understand precisely what the person is pitching about. And so I gave a couple examples in the video, which I'm happy to give again. Um, I never understand why pitches need to say pitch, and it's usually in capital letters, <laughs> brackets. Yeah. I don't know who decided that that was the style, but yeah. for some reason it's that. Yep. Study, reveal, survey. news, exclusive, yeah. survey, all of that is junk. So if you cut that out, you're probably going to get to your pitch a lot faster. Mm -hmm. All caps is not necessary. That also takes up more space. Capital letters in general isn't that necessary, maybe for your first word. But the other subject yeah. line tip I have, which I didn't mention on the video, oh, tell us. was that it should... So <laughs> if there is a company that you're pitching on behalf of and you only know them because you're working with them as a client and you're pitching, you know, because they're the client, all of that, but you wouldn't know them otherwise. That name for the company should not be in the subject line. You know, if you wouldn't know them otherwise, I don't know them otherwise. I, <laughs> you know, strongly believe that you should just cut out as much garbage and tell me, you know, there's a survey that says this, or we have experts available on, on X. Stop pretending that your company is like something I should know about, <laughs> to put bluntly. Yes, that's a good tip. So now, what is the best subject line you ever have received? Or maybe one recently where you're like, damn, that was good. Well, okay. So there's, there's a couple, sorry, I like side because it's, it's, it's so hard to think of things on the top of your head. Um, but the things that kind of make me laugh and are memorable to me is where people, so I, I have in my Twitter bio, uh, proud midnight snacker, which I really am. It's kind of a problem. And I've recently owned up to it, which I'm, I'm happy about, you know, people yeah, used to be yeah. like, I heard you eating at night. And I was like, what? You didn't hear me. Now I'm like, you know what? Proud midnight snacker on Twitter. Yep, yep. So I've found some people pitching me. It's very smart and crafty. They'll kind of like put in the subject line, like, hello from a fellow midnight snacker. 100% chance that I will click that email, even if it's not, you know, a pitch that ends up being useful to me, but I'll usually respond, like, appreciate the personalized yeah, effort. I think that that's is super great. personalized. Okay. Yeah. So you like the midnight snack <laughs> drop in there. Okay. That is valuable real estate in the subject line, but effective real estate. So I'll, I'll go with that. Okay. Yeah. I like that. That's good. <laughs> what about exclusives versus embargoes? A hot topic amongst the journalist crowd. Yes. I find embargoes are helpful but I think they're used, they're overused in journalism. And in terms of pitching journalists, I think people or PR people think that it kind of makes it more compelling if there is an embargo. Mm. That word, I remember learning it as a kid with like, you know, trade stuff and, you know, with the British and the US and all of that, the colonies. And it's weird hearing it so much now, but obviously I'm used to it. I think it's, I think it's not that important, but it's just something that we've gotten used to and you know sometimes it's quite helpful to be like okay if I'm in between stories today and I have some random piece that's on embargo you know at least I could get a jump start on that I'll make the editors happy if I get you know story done that they could set to pre-publish so that's you know it's kind of nice I, I do think it's overused exclusive it's never actually an exclusive in my experience <laughs> I mean, there's sometimes what I've had before, actually, I once worked with a company that did like an exclusive survey to help support my story that I was working on. And that I really appreciated and that I knew was exclusive. Mm -hmm. But the other stuff that I get, it doesn't, first of all, I've never spoken to them before in most cases. So, you know, we don't have that relationship for them to like, you know, exclusively 
deliver me pitches and mm. even still you know i know you're i know you're sending it to other organizations but yeah. again it's, it's not necessary to say that you're giving me an exclusive when it's not <laughs> Yeah. So just to be clear on that, because this is like somehow debated, which kind of blows my mind. Exclusive should just be, you're giving it to one person, one person, that's it. Not one person with this tip and then one person with that angle and then one person with this thing. But it sounds like Elizabeth, for you, you're kind of, you're not down with embargoes and not really down with exclusives. Yeah, I mean, embargoes I have more flexibility with just because okay. it like, comes in handy. But I, I, I think it's just overused. I don't like people using it just to, like, what is the purpose of the embargo in the first place? But yeah, again, I, I, I'd rather kind of just have the information without it trying to appear more elite or whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Today's interview will continue after this brief message brought to you by One Pitch. Are you curious to see the unique ways OnePitch helps PR professionals and marketers pitch journalists? Head to OnePitch.co to learn about our new OnePitch score and see how easy it is to find the right journalist to pitch your news to. Sign up for your free account today. Now, back to today's episode. I'm glad we demystified that. So, Elizabeth, for the stories you do, and maybe it comes in the midnight time when you are snacking, how do you come up with the stories you like to pursue and do? You have one on inflation right now, for example, which of course that's a topic on everyone's mind. You have a lot of about you know millions of people are quitting their jobs. There's all these other topics and stuff. So inflation seems to be a topic of sort right now that you're covering. But are there times and inspiration that hit you for an, a more like in-depth story you want to do? Or how do the stories come about to you? Well, first, midnight is not my like, hour that I'm really able to think about uh, anything it. besides snack. Like I'll literally wake myself up in the middle of the night and grab a snack. It is so unhealthy. I'm trying to get out of the habit. Uh-huh. But yeah, full disclosure proud of my snacker. But um anyway, I get story ideas from other stories sometimes. You know, there's mm-hmm. sometimes an interesting stat in, you know, for instance, a Wall Street Journal story and I'm like, oh, you know, I wonder why they didn't expand upon that more. But hey, maybe I could. I also get story ideas from just listening. I used to kind of put my headphones in all the time when I was on the subway or leaving my room. And I try to actually use those opportunities to hear what people are talking about on the subway or waiting in line for a COVID test or at Trader Joe's where I was yesterday. But a lot of story ideas too come from just personal experiences. For instance, you know, again, when I was at Trader Joe's yesterday, the shelves were entirely bare. I even tweeted about it and it was crazy. It was know flashbacks to March 2020. Wait, wait, you know, thinking bear? about it now. Wait, there? <laughs> in Trader Joe's bear, there, bear yeah. again. I mean, there was aged? stuff that there <laughs> there was no lettuce, there was no orange juice, there was oh. no soup. They had some stuff, so what it wasn't like as bad, but it was it was creepy. Is there a um, snowstorm coming? Like, <laughs> no, I mean everything's just screwed up with Omicron and God. people getting COVID all along the supply chain. So, you know, I bring this up because that's something that actually would probably be a good story. I didn't have a chance to tackle that today because I'm involved in a bunch of other things that need to get done. But it, it's experiences like that. I, I did a story on what's called shrinkflation recently, um, where instead of raising the prices on goods, a lot of consumers will shrink the contents. Yes. The prices. It's not always out of like a bad you know, malicious thing, but they do it. Yeah, it's a sneaky of way. Yeah. So, you know, I had a couple experiences where I was like, is it just me or did this get smaller? And I was mm-hmm. like, ah, that's a story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is a story indeed. Okay. Of all the stories you do write, and you pump out a lot, by the way, Elizabeth, you are like <laughs> rolling on it. How many stories do you do in a week, by the way? Average. It totally varies. Yeah. I'd say at the most, I would do six but you know usually I'll try to do a story today today I didn't quite get one because there's some overflow but minimum four max six or seven on a really really busy news week uh like eight (laughs) but that that hasn't been the case for a while and they're not always like you know huge long form stories sometimes it could just be something really quick and brief we call them like little keyword stories. So it's it's not always like, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs. It's just, you know, here's what's happening. Here's why you should care. Yep. Got it. Okay. 
given all those stories that you do and write, which is a lot, are there books, podcasts, TV, shows, anything that we can learn that you love? Because we love um, stories. All the above. Um, I try to, you know, I, lo- I know a lot of people listen to podcasts for news and stuff like that. And I definitely do that. I like the Wall Street Journal podcast. It gives you a good overview of what's going on in the world in kind of a jargon free way, which I appreciate. Oh, which also one though? Which one? Some, it's called, uh, what is it called? Shoot. See, I, I just tell Alexa, I'm like, oh, what's news? I think that's what it's called. Oh, okay. Um, I never actually tap it on my phone. Thank you, Alexa, for there you go. helping me out. There you go. I am also attempting to read the book by Andrew Ross Sorkin called Too Big to Fail, and it's quickly oh, becoming too yeah. big to read. Yes. But the 08 crisis <laughs> always um, fascinated me. Um, so I'm learning oh, a little I've bit more about so, that. Yeah, okay. Um, yep. A real life thriller about the most tumultuous yeah. period in America's financial history by a kind yeah. <laughs> New York Times writer, reporter, Andrew Ross. Yes, Storkin. Yes. Oof. Okay. Yeah, that is a hefty one. Okay. Anything else? Do you have any shows you watch? Do you ever just watch something for fun? Oh, all the time. I think this is a popular show amongst journalists, but what? Succession. Oh, my it. Really sad God. that it ended just now. Oh, well, not I, ended for good, but... Ended for now. It was so sad to think about it. Man, I, I agree. recently started... I agree. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> so bad. good. It's Best good. acting. I love it. Oh. <laughs> what else? Oh, I started binging the morning show. Oh, how is keeping it? Keeping the news. Yes. It's a great show. Really? I like it. Okay. Um, Where, what is it on, though? Oh, it's on Apple. It's on Apple. 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 Yeah, Apple. it is. Okay. What else is there? I have like a little like, most of my shows are on HBO. Okay, which me too. I would say, and I think it's important to like have a lot of shows to distract you from what's going on in the world yeah. all the time. So yeah. I have like more fun stuff too. And I always love watching The Office, but it's That's sad, fun. But it's not on Netflix anymore, but that used to be kind of my go-to distraction. Damn, show. who owns that now? Did Amazon get it? Oh, Peacock. Oh, geez. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's fascinating to think of like, and maybe that I'm sure someone has done an in-depth story about this on just like the intellectual property wars of owning this, the like classic sitcom treasure trophy. It's kind of like the new art for, for networks. It's like a lot. I mean, that was Netflix's top watch even though they hadn't aired in a while. You know what else I saw too? I saw a post on this, I think on Instagram talking about how comparing the, the, like the, the picture of the golden girls thing versus um, sex in the cities, new Mm -hmm. like poster. And the shocking thing is like, you should look, look this up right now is that the women are the same age, but in the golden girls one, you would be like, Oh, there's my grandmother wearing her frumpy stuff, looking all ancient versus the, the iteration of sex in the city, which is not called even sex in the city. It's called in just like that. But anyway, I'm like, Oh, how interesting. So the the point is, I wonder who owns the golden girls. And I wonder if there's going to be a boost in golden girl thing, especially since Betty White died. Anyway, we're going down a rabbit hole this bit. That is not the point. The next question <laughs> I have for you is what do you think the future of journalism looks like? Well, every day on Twitter, at least since the year started, I feel like I'm seeing more and more personal news. And like, oh my God, not have personal news I and job know. changes. But there was also <laughs> some big news. It's with- true. It's true. And we <laughs> are recording this in very early January. So just for people to know, it seems like it's the time to mention these things. Yes. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so one of the personal news is, was the editor in chief of Bloomberg leaving along with one of the top oh, media columnists yes. at the time yes. to kind of start their own, you know, media startup. There's not too many details on what that is yet, but I think the way that, or what that sort of symbolizes to me mm-hmm. is that reporters, more reporters are going to become business people. So mm-hmm. using their following to kind of, you know, say, okay, I don't need an organization behind me right now. I've worked up this whole portfolio of people that love me. I'm going to take what I do best and I'm going to make it my own thing, you know, have my own journalism standards, all of that. And I don't know how successful it's all going to be. I think, you know, it's sort of similar to the big wave of journalists that also left organizations, but instead of forming a new one, they just took to Substack. 
I think that trend might have peaked a little bit. Um, I think it's really hard. I personally can't imagine mm-hmm. doing that. Mm-hmm. But I, I do well, think there's going to be more people trying to fill voids using their following and you know jump starting something new. Yeah, and I love that. Would have some entrepreneurship going on in there. But curious though yeah. to see what is the appetite for you know 37 substacks that you're going to land in your inbox a day. You know, that, that I think is the other question is like, yeah. is there a saturation point to all of this? No, I mean, there definitely is. People are like constantly making jokes that they think their inbox is like over cluttered and it's because of all the subjects that they apply to. And I think, or, you know, subscribe to. And I think, you know, sometimes you lose track of who wrote what and the meaning gets lost. And, you know, it's no, not trying to insult the journalists that do that because yeah. there's some really good stuff out there, but it's, it's a bit oversaturated, I would say. Um, and the niche things actually do quite better. So if you're focusing in something very, very specific, that's kind of one way to stand out. Mm-hmm. But the newsletters are very hard to keep track of. There's so many. There's so many. Elizabeth, I'm so glad you joined us today and giving us not only your pitch tips, but a sticky that outlined your pitch tips on the video. Everyone needs to check out Elizabeth's pitch tip video because it is, it is, it is passionate for sure, for sure. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on today. Elizabeth Buckwild, she's from Market Watch. They don't just talk about the market. Get on there and check it out. And write your subject line thoughtfully. Yeah. Thank you. Thoughtfully, agreed. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Coffee with a Journalist featuring Elizabeth Buckwald from Market Watch. If you enjoy listening to our show, Make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you have a moment, please leave us a review to share your thoughts about the show and today's guest. To learn more about the latest tools on OnePitch and to subscribe to our weekly podcast newsletter, head to our website at onepitch.co. We'll see you all next week with a brand new guest and even more insights about the journalists you want to learn more about. Until then, start great stories.